Uh, we've been in a series entitled 25 Vision, and it was really birthed because I learned that 2020 Vision, which I grew up believing was excellent, is actually only average. That's kind of been the goal growing up, uh, but I found out that 2015 Vision is better, 2010 Vision is excellent, but 25 Vision is exceptional. It's sharp as a tack. It's, it's, it's the vision that you want um, if you are a bird of prey. Most birds of prey are the ones that hold the 25 vision so they could see a little rodent way down there. And I just felt like, you know, the days that we're living in, I'm sure every generation felt like this, but the days that we're living in, I just really believe that we cannot settle for average vision. And we talked about how the Bible speaks about vision. It's not just like setting goals. Even though those are good, the Bible speaks about vision as uh, the, the word is kazone. It literally means a revelation of God, a revelation of who he is, a revelation of what uh, his will is for your life and what his will is for your life in every season. And I just really believe that God wants us not to have average but exceptional vision in this area. So I want to uh, open up our Bibles to Exodus chapter 8. I'm going to read there. You can follow along with me if you'd like to. Exodus chapter 8, verse 1, it says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and tell him, Thus says the Lord. And Pastor James, can you turn off that amp for me in, uh, on the platform? It'd be awesome. Thank you, sir. Um, he says, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, uh, but if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all of your country with frogs. How many of you guys like frogs? He goes on to say, the Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and onto your bed, come on somebody, into your houses of your servants and your people and into your ovens and your knitting bowls. It's not a good plague. Into your knitting bowls. He goes on to say, the frogs shall come up. On you and on your people and on all of your servants. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the canals, over the pools, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. I, I want to talk to you around this idea of tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Would you pray with me, Father, in Jesus' name, as we open up your word, illuminate our hearts and our minds, speak to us in a very real way, in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, listen, I want to take you back to 9 p.m. on a Sunday night, October 8th, 1871. There was a man by the name of D.L. Moody was preaching in Chicago, and that night, fires erupted in Chicago, unlike our country had ever experienced. Now, many of you guys have heard of the Chicago fires. They were devastating. They destroyed about 3.3 um, miles of property. There were 100,000 people that were left homeless. And D.L. Moody was preaching on this night. Now, now, at the end of his service, at the end of his sermon, he said, listen, I want you guys to all go home and think about and evaluate your relationship with Jesus. And then I want you to come back next week and make a decision. Well, after he was done with his sermon, the fires erupted. As he was concluding, fire engines were storming the city. And many of those people that sat in his service that night never got to see next Sunday. Their homes were destroyed. D.O. Moody's home and church was both burned down. And above all of that devastation... D.L. Moody sat with this weight, this guilt of how could I ask people to wait a week? How could I ask them to contemplate for a whole week about their relationship with Jesus as if tomorrow was promised? So he said, he said, moving forward, he said, I'd rather cut off my right hand than to give people a week ever again. And so he declared that every time I preach, I'm going to give an opportunity for people to receive Jesus. Now, now I want you to get this picture because sometimes it's easy just to say tomorrow. 
So, so here God raises up Moses, says, I want you to set my people free. Now, Moses is not really on board at first. He's like, God, what do you want me to do? You really want me to go to the king of Egypt, which was Pharaoh, and tell him to let your people go. Like, please let all of the slaves go that are serving you. And God says, absolutely, I'm going to be with you. It's exactly what I want you to do. You're going to see my power. It's going to be amazing. So that's what he does. He, he goes to Pharaoh, and God demonstrates his glory and his power by sending 10 plagues because Pharaoh was reluctant. He did not want to let God's people go. And so the second plague was the plague of the frogs. Now, could you just imagine having these frogs everywhere? Now, I, I've been camping before. This last year, we, we caught a bullfrog. They're just nasty creatures, right? And to have them plaguing your home, in your bed, like, like you're, you're, you're going to sleep, and it's like, right, right. All over your house, all over you. I mean, just imagine. This wasn't like a couple of frogs here and there. It was a plague. And so with all of that as a backdrop, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people, and I will let your people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people that you and your houses may be rid. I love how Moses throws in the houses, that you and your houses may be rid of the frogs, except for those that remain in the Nile, because we still want to preserve the frogs. We're not going to get rid of all of them. They can live in the Nile, and it's, it's fair game. And Pharaoh's response is crazy. I mean, here he says, you set the time. What an awesome opportunity. Like, like Pharaoh, let me know when, and look at his response. He says, tomorrow. Pharaoh said, Moses replied, it will be as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will leave you and your houses, your officials, and your people. They will remain only in the Nile. Like, really? One more night with the frogs? I mean, you have the authority, the ability to say, right now. And some scholars believe that he might have not believed that God can do it in one night because it was so bad. Yeah. Other uh, scholars said that, that maybe he thought it would subside so he wouldn't have to yield or submit to the Lord. But nevertheless, God gave him the opportunity and the option, and he says, tomorrow. Like, could you imagine you're laying down at night, and that's like you're, you're regretting that decision every moment. Frogs are, are you know ribbiting all over the place, croaking here, croaking there, and it's like, what in the world did I just do? But, but I think in our day, too, it's, it's so easy to complain about the darkness in our land. It's super easy to look out and just be like, man, it's so wicked. It's getting so crazy. Like, I'm not really sure there's a lot of weird people out there, man. It's just, we're close to the end times. And, and it's, it's really easy to complain about the darkness while forgetting that as followers of Jesus, that God has given us authority and the ability and his presence to step into the darkness, to share the good news of Jesus, which is the antidote to the plague of sin and death. And so many times, even though we have this ability and this authority, we, we, we say, maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow I'm going to really kind of kick my prayer life into gear. Maybe tomorrow I'm actually going to share the love of Jesus with somebody. Maybe tomorrow I'm actually going to invite somebody to lunch and, and have that conversation. And so, so it's so easy to complain about the dark, but I wonder if the Lord is looking like, hey, why are you complaining about the dark while you're holding the light? Tomorrow. And so I don't want anybody to feel bad, but I hope all of us feel convicted today at some level. Like that's been my prayer, Lord, convict all of our hearts today in such a great way. Because the, the question is this, why do we wait? Why is it always tomorrow when it comes to sharing the gospel, when it comes to telling somebody about the good news of Jesus? And some of you guys are doing it all the time. You might have the gift of evangelism and it's just kind of natural for you. But I wonder how many of us every single day are seizing the moments and the opportunities, the ability and the opportunities that God has placed before us with his presence, just like he was with Moses. He said, I'll be with you. Like, go share the love of Jesus. Go share the good news. 
But, but I think if we were to, to look at why we don't, I think fear is, is a huge culprit. I think today in our culture, we're afraid of what people think. Many of us don't really know, like Moses, what do I say? Like, you want me to go to the king of the land and say, let, let God's people go so they can worship him? Like, it, it almost sounds a little crazy, right? Like, <laughs> let all your slaves go that are building your empire because God says so. And so for us, it can feel a, a little bit weird sometimes. I don't want to be the weirdo. Or, or, or maybe it's because we're self-consumed. And as long as we're good, we're good. And, and anything, you know, sharing the gospel, it takes time. It can be a little bit of an inconvenience. But I, I want to get underneath all of our excuses today, underneath all of the busyness, underneath all of the fears, and really talk about, I, I think, the real reason while we say, tomorrow, tomorrow. And, and I think it's because, and, and I, I could be totally wrong, but I, I know this has been true in my life at times. I think it's either we never realized or we forgot the urgency. Like we, like we forgot the urgency. I, I remember um, Jackie and I, when I first asked her to be my girlfriend, it was like the most awkward thing. Because I, I was single for three years. I was following Jesus. I just never, I never had like this, this Christian relationship. And I just remember thinking to myself, what do I say? You, you remember back in the day, we would say things like, will you go with me? Um, like, do I write a note to her and with a checkbox? Like, will you be my girlfriend? Yes or no? So I just kept it simple. And we were on a trip with her parents, with her parents. Um, and we were at her grandmother's house in L.A. And I'll never forget, it was on, on, her, on the back lawn. And I just went for it. I just said, hey, listen, will you be my girlfriend? Like, can we make this thing official? And then I thought afterwards, I'm like, man, that would have been a really long ride home. You're in Los Angeles. If she said no, that would have been brutal. Could you imagine driving home like, oh, gosh, this is going to be a long ride. But, but it was a long ride home because we, we got in the car and everything couldn't have been better. I got a brand new truck. I got a great job. Right? I wasn't pastoring yet. Um, last service, it kind of sounded like I had a great job, and then I started pastoring. Um, but I, I had a great job, loved Jesus, got the girl of my dreams. And we're on Highway 5, and all of a sudden, we've all experienced this, where you have to use the restroom. <laughs> and Highway 5, I'm not going to be graphic, but Highway 5 is not the most ideal place to really have to use the bathroom because there's not a whole lot of stops and so you know that, that feeling, and sometimes it happens in church. You've been sitting in church. You get into a conversation, and you're like, oh, my goodness, I have got to go. But you can't find a break in the conversation, so you're just trying to endure, endure. Finally, you're like, hold that thought. I got to go. And, and so, so it came to that moment. I'm, I'm trying to have conversation, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, I have to go to the restroom so bad. And, and in that process, I pass the exit. Like, who does that? 25 miles to the next exit. So I look at Jackie and I, I just repent. I'm like, I'm so sorry for what I'm about to do, but I really need to use the restroom. I pulled over, put it in reverse, like backed up on Highway 5, breaking all the laws, backed off of the exit, went to the... We just do some crazy stuff when it's urgent. Let me say it this way. We create space when things are serious and when things are urgent. Like, like it may shift our, all of our priorities in that moment because it's serious and it's urgent. And I want you to see how important it is that we just don't have a vision for ourselves and our life, but part of that vision should really be with a vision for people in the world. Like it's, it's gotta be it can be about us a little bit, but it can't be all about us. God's purpose for you, the reason why God has given you gifts, they're not for you. They're for other people. His word says it clearly. And so this is so serious that Jesus said it this way. He said, for the son of man, why did he come? To seek and to save the lost. Like this is huge. Jesus could have said anything. He's saying, this is why I came. This is how serious it is. This is how urgent it is. It's not just a good idea that we do once in a while. No, he said, the reason why I came is to seek and to save the lost. 
And I think Paul's going to help us understand this because, again, sometimes maybe you've never realized or maybe you've forgotten how serious and how urgent this really is, that heaven and hell are in the balance every single day. And, and Paul writes a letter to the church of Ephesians, to the church in Ephesus. He's writing to the people in the church who have experienced God's grace. They know who he is. And, and I feel like God, he's going to give us a great picture so we're going to be all over Ephesians chapter 2, but let's, let's go there together. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1 and 2, it says, As for you, as for you, you were dead. You were dead in your transgressions, in your sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. And of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work within those who are disobedient. Like if I told you, my, my, my friend here, if I looked out to you right now and said, hey, guys, I, I think he's going to make it. Like, I, I really think he's going to pull through. Maybe he's just, he's just struggling a little bit. He's going through some, he has a little bit of issues. But maybe if we put some fresh clothes on him, change some of his ways a little bit. And some of you guys are looking at me like, this is so corny, right? Like, okay, where are you going? I know where you're going with this, Pastor Matt. Yeah, but, but, but maybe not. Because inside, we all kind of laugh at that, right? Even though we know that God can raise the dead. I told our team today, I said, here's, here's your test. Go for it. <laughs> Lay hands on him, right? Everybody's like, and everybody started laughing because it, it's, it's this reality that, that he, he's dead. See, Paul didn't say we were bad. He said we were dead. That, that's totally different. Then he goes on to say, not only were you dead, but remember at that time, in verse 12, he says, you were separate from Christ. So you weren't only dead, you were separate. Anybody ever have separation anxiety? Come on, you lose your phone for five minutes. Some of you are like, Lord. And we could go down the list, right? We all know how it feels to have separation anxiety, but, but let, me, let me bring it closer to home. Do you remember before Christ when a storm hit? When, when, a tra when tragedy struck, when circumstances went rogue and life was chaotic and you were wondering if it was going to work? And you're like, man, I don't know if I'm going to make it through. And, and there was this sense of anxiety because there, there was nothing to hold on to. We, we start grabbing for this, grabbing for that. We, 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 we feel alone. We're trying to hold on to this. And Paul was saying, listen, those that are separated from Christ, there's no divine purpose. There's no destiny. There's no freedom. There's no life. There's nothing to hold on to. There's no anchor. You remember the disciples? There was a time when they got caught in a storm, and Jesus was in their boats taking a nap. Love Jesus. He, he, he just knows how to make an entrance in the moment. And so they're like, oh, my goodness, we're about to die. Jesus, wake up. And just the fact that when their faith was starting to get shaken as a storm arose, they had him to hold on to. Lord, wake up. God. We're, we're, we're going to die. Like they were able to hold on to him in the struggle, but not the separated. Not the separated. Not the dead and separated. But they're trying to hold on to something because Ecclesiastes, Solomon says this in chapter 3, that God has placed eternity in the hearts of every human being. So when we see tragedy, when we see death, we're, we're complexed and we're like, surely this can't be it. Something's wrong with this picture. There's got to be more to life than this. Something is wrong. There's got to be more. But Paul said, not for those that are dead and separate. They, they, don't, they don't have that. See, well, let, let me say it like this. If you're in Christ or you're not in Christ, you may be either coming out of a storm, entering into a storm, or a storm is coming. Yeah. And you're like, Pastor Matt, can you be a little bit more positive today? Yes. I'm totally positive that you're either coming out of a storm, you're entering a storm, or a storm is coming. But, but if you're dead and separate, can I just tell you, those moments don't end well. A lot of times they end very tragic. Not even just death, but death to something. Death to marriages, death to relationships, death to hope. 
And so, so, so get this picture. Like, they don't have the opportunity to say, God, help me. Paul said, no, no, they're separate. They, they, don't, they don't know about the Savior. They don't have a deliverer. They don't understand divine purpose. They don't understand destiny. They're dead and they're separate. Are you guys tracking with me? He goes on to say, he says, remember that not only were you separate from Christ, but excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise. And so, so we have this beautiful reality that, that as Gentiles, non-Jewish descent, that in Christ now we are grafted in. And, and there's this beautiful reality that Jesus is now our king. And what flows from this beautiful reality of him being our king is his protection, his blessing. But he says, man, those who are separate, those who are dead, and those who are foreigners, they don't, they don't get to partake in that flow. They, they don't get to partake in God's divine covenant and God's divine uh, covenant promises. That, that, that he said, listen, I'm going to give my people a land. And can I tell you, for Israel, right, there, there was a destination. But for you and I in Christ, I believe that there is territory and, and, and places and things, regions that God wants you to take a hold of. But apart from him, if you're dead, if you're separate and a foreigner, you're never going to be able to experience that. There's areas of your life right now that God wants to give you more territory in. But it's not going to happen that way. He says, man, I, I want to I not just give you more territory, but a priesthood, a kingdom. The kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And to those of us who believe, it's, it's not just now, it's, it's eternity and heaven later. But, but remember what the apostle John said. He said that, he said, this is, this is eternal life that you know him. So, so eternal life isn't just a destination later. It's a relationship now. But he says, those that are dead, those that are separate, those that are foreigners, they, they, they don't get this. Now, Jackie and I, for about seven years, we hosted international students from China. It was one of the greatest seasons of our life. Um, all of them did not know Jesus or many of them hadn't even contemplated the reality of Christ. And so, and they lived with us. And I'll never forget um, his name is Danny. We took him to Red Robin. Now, now in, in his culture, with his family, they would always eat big. Like, everything is big every time they eat. So, I mean, there's just a huge spread. His parents would come and visit, and we understood really quickly that, man, they'd love to sit at the table. And, and I mean, just we would eat sushi, and there'd be so much sushi. I'm just like, thank you, Lord. Right? And, I, and, and I'm not paying the bill on that one, right? It's like... Oh, let it come, Lord. Let it flow. And we would leave so full, but I remember we took him to Red Robin, and he was like, he said, hey, Matt, wh why do you guys eat so little? Because he had, you know, a burger, fries, and a drink. I'm like, bro, these are bottomless fries here. This is like, you're living luxurious right now. And then I showed him the bill, and I'm like, this is why we eat very little um, around here these days. So, so we started laughing, but it just was foreign to him. Like, if you've ever been to a country where English is not the primary language, it, it's amazing to me that many times when we're, we're trying to communicate, people are looking at you perplexed. Like, I, I don't know. And you're like, I, I need to use the restroom. Is there a bathroom? And they're like, I don't know. And then we think if we yell, they're gonna, it's get, like the lights are going to go on. I need a bathroom. And they're like, I don't get it. And, and I, think, I think sometimes as the church, if we are not careful, you guys ready for this? That when it comes to people that are dead, that are separate, that are foreigners, and they don't understand, many times we don't take the time to learn the language, to preach the gospel to them. Instead, many times we get frustrated and just want to yell. This is what you should do. And they're just like, what? like they just don't have a concept. They don't, they don't understand. They're outside of God, outside of his blessing, outside of his promise, outside of his protection, outside of God's provision. They're outside of his direction. And they are extremely vulnerable. Extremely vulnerable. And I want you to catch this, that this is people that we love. That are dead. That are separate. That are foreigners. Paul continues in verse 12, 
And he said, not only are they foreigners to the covenant of the promise, they're without hope. See, when you don't have the promises of God and Christ as your anchor, can I just tell you, you're going to try to hold on to something. And the devastating part is it doesn't work. And because it doesn't work, it just shatters hope constantly. Get a little bit of a wind and then shatters hope because it just can't sustain. And Paul was like, don't you remember when you tried everything? Remember you tried that relationship? Bad idea. You tried that addiction? Maybe you tried that porn? Maybe you tried that success? Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you tried those opportunities? And you quickly realize that there's nothing on this side of eternity that actually can give me this, this hope. It all leads to a place of there's got to be more. Yeah. Oh, my goodness, there's got to be more. Yeah. And everything that you try to grab a hold of like that on this side of eternity, I promise you, I'm so sorry to say this, but it's going to disappoint you. Can I just tell you, me as your pastor, I'm going to disappoint you. Yeah. Don't hold on to me. Yeah. I'm here to point you to him, yeah, so the one who will never fail. So continues that, remember that at that time you were separated from God, excluded from citizenships, foreigners, without hope, and now, Paul said, let me just remind you, you're without God. And this is devastating. It's, you want to know why it's so devastating? Because of what Jesus says in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Love that part. The last part, apart from me, you can do nothing. I would be so bold enough to say today that life is impossible without God. Yeah. Like real life. Like you can go to the store. You can go through the mechanics of life. But, but when you're looking from an eternal perspective, when you're looking at, at the satisfaction of your soul, I love, I love what, um, what is his name? I forgot who it was that said this. But he said, I want to be so close to God. That when I get to heaven, it takes me a moment to realize I'm there. Like, like we have that, oh, Dallas Willard, that's who said that. Uh, we, we have this, this, this opportunity to, to, to be with him. But I, I don't know, like, why do we always say when it comes to others, are we, why do we always say tomorrow? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, like, does this, does this just already, does it create a sense of urgency on the inside of you? to know that there are some of your family members that are dead, separate, foreigners, without hope and without God. Like the people that you talk to every single day, people that you go to school with every single day are living in this reality. But the hard part is this. You know why I think we, we, we don't get it? Is because they have a face. And it looks okay. Like they don't look totally separate. They don't look like they're dead. They don't, they don't look like they're foreigners. They don't look like they're without hope. They don't look like they're without God. In fact, when we ask them how they're doing, they say, great, yeah. fine. Everything is good. Of course, always things should always be better, but things are, are good. And so it's so easy to just be like, oh, my goodness, you're not really dead. You're not really separate. You're not really foreigner. You're not really without hope. You're not really without God because you have this face on, and we're like, Tomorrow. And the enemy says, exactly, exactly, tomorrow. So it's, I think sometimes when we look at people, when we think about the loss, we don't think like this. We think, yeah, they, they probably need to hear Jesus. Yeah, they could probably, we could probably improve their life a little. Yeah, they're struggling a little bit. Yeah, I have some issues, but maybe put on some fresh clothes and just kind of help them out a little bit. No, no, and, and Paul says, no, no, remember, you were dead. You were, you were separate. You were a foreigner. You were without hope. You were without God. It's not going to go well for you. Nothing. There's nothing apart from him. But then, then you know, God is so faithful, right? And there, there's always a but God. Aren't you thankful for the but gods? It's like Christian humor. Right, But God, but God, because of his great love for us, God who is mercy made us alive with Christ. Even what? Even while we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. So now in Christ, it's like, no, no, no. But because of Christ, not by your works, but by his grace, you and I are made alive. Can I just tell you, this is... Lean into this. This changes everything, ladies and gentlemen. 
When you are alive in Christ, the game totally changes. A lot of times it's confusing for people, though, because we have a lot of people in church that proclaim alive, but they really live this way. We have a lot of folks in church that's like, yeah, I, I am, but they're really not. And they're still struggling with death, feeling separated. They're still, they may be here, but it doesn't mean they're saved. But, but in Christ, he says, man, I, I want you, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make you alive. Not good, not better, alive. You, you, you know how Paul would say it, I think, in today's day, God, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. He goes on to say, not only alive, but now in Christ Jesus, you who, who were once far away have been brought near. So now you're no longer separate. Now you're brought near. And this word near in the Greek, it literally means like, come here, get over here. Like it's the antithesis of being separated. You're secure. I got you. There's an anchor for your soul. Like you were lost and now you were found. Welcome home. My presence is with you. And can I just tell you, when you're near to God and you are engaged with him, you don't feel as vulnerable when the enemy comes around. You feel emboldened. And confident, not in yourself, but in who's holding you. So when the enemy comes around now, it's like, oh, I see you. But remember, I'm clothed and I'm covered. Because not only am I alive and near, Paul goes on to say, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens. Citizens have different rights, different authority, different perspective. Not citizens of church, citizens of heaven. And when you're a citizen of heaven and you understand that reality, that you are seated with Christ in heavenly places, when the enemy and the world tries to tear you apart, it feels different than when you're separate. It feels different than when you're a foreigner. You're a citizen. Your home is not here. But God has given you rights. He's given you authority. He's given you an inheritance. And when you understand who you are in Christ, and you understand this great exchange that happened on the cross, via the cross, his life, his death, and his resurrection, it changes the game, ladies and gentlemen. It changes how you walk. Like when you belong and you know that, man, this is, this is it. I, one of the things I love about Paul is Paul... He, he said, on one hand, I'm the chief of all sinners. On the other hand, he's proclaiming the grace of God from the mountaintops. Paul was infinitely humbled and infinitely confident at the very same time. That is a healthy identity in Christ. Uh, humility is not like, oh, like, man. And confidence doesn't mean you're arrogant. It's just, no, I know in whom I believed. I was once dead, separate, a foreigner, without hope, without God, but... Because of his grace and his mercy, he made me alive, brought me near, and I'm a citizen now. Do you see? That's humility and confidence at the very same time. Now you're starting to walk differently. When you understand you're a citizen, you're starting to walk differently. And not only did Paul say, not only are you a citizen, but now he came and preached peace to you. My mic is gone. There it goes. When you were far away. And peace to those who were near, for it is through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. So he says, I, I, I've now given you peace. You know this word preached is where we get the word evangelism. It's preaching the good news of Jesus, that now he is our peace, that we're no longer dead, we're no longer separate, we're no longer foreigners, we're, we're no longer far away, we've been brought near, we are alive, we are citizens, we are near. I mean, just, just get this picture in your mind. And God has now given us the ability to hold on to his promises. There's peace now in the midst of chaos. There's hope. No longer without hope. I, I got peace now that no matter what happens to me, I'm secure. You know, when I was in the sixth grade, I got pneumonia in the trachea. I was coming back from Tahoe, and I couldn't breathe. 
So my mom was like, maybe, it, you know, you just you're struggling a little bit. I was struggling a lot. So my mom's like, I'm taking you to the hospital. They said if my mom would have stopped at one stop sign, I would have died. She took me to Eden Hospital in Castro Valley. And by the time I got there, I was, I was breathing like this. I was so exhausted from breathing. I just told them, let me go to sleep. And they were, like, trying to give me asthma stuff. They're like, no, no. And one doctor was like, this is an asthma. Like, we need to get a tube in his throat, like ASAP. So they thought they were going to have to cut me open. They ended up putting the smallest tube Eden Hospital's ever done. Next thing you know, they paralyze me. I'm on a ventilator. You know, and two weeks later, I wake up in Children's Hospital. They transport me to Children's Hospital. And I just remember waking up, and, and I have all the stuff in my mouth. Now, I know there, there are kids in here. So I was on so much pharmaceuticals that, that I thought I was in a science lab. I was like, Mom, like, are they dissecting me? But I just had all this stuff in my mouth. And I remember when they took out the tube and I could breathe. It was like, <sighs> and I just really believe that it's a word for somebody today that you've been struggling to breathe. And the beautiful thing is that when you're alive, when you're near, when you're a citizen, and there is the peace of of God on your life. God doesn't always remove the situation, but he allows you to breathe in the midst of the pain. He allows you to breathe in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the difficulty, in the midst of the, the, the chaos. It's like you can still breathe. And, and if, if, that, if it doesn't get any better than that, he goes on to say, and in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So now you're not without God, and you just don't have him. Like he dwells in you. By the power of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of every believer. So no longer are you simply without God, and you just have him. No, you are the temple now where he dwells by way of his Spirit. In Christ. The same spirit that rose him up from the dead now lives on the inside of us as followers of Jesus. Can, can you guys get this picture? This is why Jesus came. He didn't come just to, you know, kind of get people through a service, help them change a little bit, be nice, just be kind to them. He came to bring life where there was death. He came to turn darkness into light. And this is, this is what he says. For God says, just the right time, I heard you. Aren't you so grateful God hears you? On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Not tomorrow, but today is the day of salvation. You should say, Pastor Matt, what? We'll, we'll, what do I do from here? First of all, I just want you to get this image in your mind. We talk about sharing your faith with people and, 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 and sharing the good news of Jesus. We're not just talking about, hey, let's just try to, let's try to make my, my guy here a little better. No, no, this is the reality. They're dead. They're separate. They're foreign. They're without hope. They're without God. And, and, and what, what are we excited that God wants to do is make them alive, bring them near, make, give them citizenship in heaven, give them peace, and have his spirit dwelling on the inside of them. Life just changes at that point. You don't just get a little better. So I'm hoping this creates an urgency. Like, like if you can just see beyond the face. Oh gosh, sometimes if we could just see the heart. Yes. But that's why we need to pray. It's because we need to ask God, Lord, help us to see what you see. If your mission was to seek and to save the lost, that has to be our mission. It can't be tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. I want you to pray. Maybe there's three people right now that God will bring to your mind that you can start praying for. That you would step out and, and, and share the good news of Jesus. And you're like, oh my goodness, I'm not really sure exactly what to do. Well, man, can I just tell you, it's not as hard as you think. Just tell them, man, I was dead. I was separated. I was a foreigner. I was without hope. I was without, without God. But, but now the game has changed. I'm alive. Like I was talking to somebody in the hallway, like, man, people will sometimes will just say, man, you're like the nicest person I met. You know what's a great segue there? It's just like, yeah, I used to not be that way. I used to be dead. What do you mean? So glad you asked. 
But when it's urgent, you're not going to care. You're not going to try to have it polished. You're just going to figure out a way to reach them. And I think that's just what, that's what we need. I'm not saying being uneducated. I'm saying, no, if we're going to reach people, you need to understand the Bible. You need to understand, man, like how to share the gospel. You need to understand what the gospel is. So that should be all the motivation. Like we're just not reading the word to have a little quiet time to feel good. Like we're, so many times what God is speaking to me in my devotional time, I use it that day somewhere with somebody. And so let this just create an urgency that it's not just cutesy patootsy church. It's like, no, like, like people are dead that we love. Never forget. So I want you to pray. And then I just want you to invite. I'm so grateful my mom invited me to church on a Sunday when I didn't want to go. And that day God met me at that service in a powerful way. Invite people to your small group. Invite them to lunch. Like share your story with them. Invite them to church. Again, I, I, I'm just saying, we, my, I'm standing here before you because my mom invited me to church. That was it. She said, honey, with a lot of prayer behind it, I think we should go to church this weekend. Nah, uh, yeah. And the game changed. And it's interesting because I, I rededicated my life in St. Louis, Missouri. My mom's job transferred from San Francisco to St. Louis. She didn't want to go, but she just felt like the Lord was calling her to go, and she went all by herself. And it was the hardest thing she ever had to do. I chose to stay behind because I was living in the world. I definitely didn't want to go to the Midwest. And I just, I just remember the, the loneliness that she had to endure. She went to a new her kids are here. Her family's here. She's in a new state by herself. It snows there. She's like, and she's like, I just felt compelled. I don't know why. I just felt like Jesus wanted me to do this. I think it's such a great picture of the gospel because the Lord knew for my circumstance, I needed to be removed from my current setting to meet him. He could have met me here very easy. But for me, for my story, that's for some reason he knew I need to take this kid out of state. And so what did she do? She, she became separated. She became a foreigner. She had hope. But I just thought it was what a picture of the gospel that in Christ steps out of heaven <laughs> to die. To separate himself, even though he was God. He did not consider equality with God something to be grasped and took on the form of a servant. How powerful is that? Became a foreigner so that you and I would be alive. Just amazing. God is super faithful. Let me pray for you. Father, I'm just so grateful that God that you and my mom didn't say tomorrow maybe next week. Lord, I pray, Lord, for those who are here that maybe they're feeling dead, separate, foreign, or maybe if you're here, you're tuning in online, you're just like, man, Pastor Matt, I really need God to make me alive. I want to be near to him. I want to be a citizen of heaven. I want his peace. I want the spirit of God dwelling on the inside of me. If you're here, would you just slip up your hand if you say that to me? I just want to see your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. Don't wait till next week. Today is the day. If you're online, you can let us know. We'd love to pray with you and for you. If there's anybody here, I'm just going to wait another second. Yep, I see your hand. Awesome. So good. Yep, see your hand, sir. Thank you. It's great. Come on, I'm going to pray a prayer with you. We're all going to pray together. But look, can we pray this with them? This is just, uh, it's kind of like when you're repeating marriage vows. Um, I'm going to say them, but you're making them your own. And just pray with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, today I surrender. I don't want to be dead anymore. Make me alive. I'm letting go of the idols, of all the things that can't give me hope. And I'm grabbing a hold of you and your grace. So would you forgive me for my sin? Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Make me alive today. I believe you died on the cross 
and rose from the dead so I could be alive. Fill me with your spirit and teach me your ways. Give me a hunger for you, for your presence, for your word, and give me a hunger for lost people. Help me to see beyond the smiley face and share your love with everyone. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, can we give Jesus a big hand today? That's awesome.